Okay, we're good. Hi, Michael. Hey. So I'm excited for our session today. Tell me a little bit about yourself. You mentioned that you were a student. How can I best be of service to you today? Um, I'm not sure how this works, to be honest, but uh, I'm 19. I am very interested in the effects side of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Um, I've just been doing small projects, like game projects. Um, so you've been doing your own personal stuff? Yeah. Uh, awesome. Also with school, too. So you're, you're in college then, at 19? Yeah. That's rad. Uh, is it like an art school, or is it just a general university or community? Uh, or? It's... It's like an art school. Uh, art school. It's nice. called AIE at uh, Seattle. Oh, what is it called again? I was uh, AIE. AIE. Uh, it's short for Academy of Interactive Entertainment uh, in Seattle. Nice. Well, I've got your stuff here. You you mentioned you weren't sure really how it works. That's totally fine. Basically, what this is is it's your time to ask any questions that you want. We can go over your portfolio. I can talk a little bit about like different um, concepts for you to focus on or general advice as you're preparing to get a job at some point. Mm -hmm. Really, it's whatever you would like to tailor it for. Typically, the best place to start is with the demo reel. Uh, but maybe first, before we dive into that, you could tell me what's like your dream job. Right. Uh... I would love to be an FX artist. Okay. Um, I, th I think that comes first, and then second comes uh, 3D, uh, so being a 3D character artist. You want to do effects, and I guess I'll kind of get an idea of the kind of effects you want to do as I dive in, but which kinds of games would you like to do effects for? Are we talking like, you know, Call of Duty, or do you want to do World of Warcraft, or do you want to do like uh, Smash Brothers? It's uh, kind of some games that you're like, those are the effects that I want to do. Yeah. Um, I love League of Legends. Uh, I've been following it for quite a while, actually, for like a good like eight eight years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's I guess that's the type of game that I've been following. And like Overwatch, for a good, good example. Uh, okay. So sort of a hand-painted, yeah, hand crisp edge, dramatic style. Cool. Well, let's check out what you got. I'm just going to kind of go through here. Knowing that that's your goals, I will tailor the feedback accordingly as if you were getting ready to apply for a job on League of Legends or perhaps on Overwatch. Obviously, I can speak more to the League of Legends side. But, okay. Um, I have some insight into what they look for over on Overwatch as well, so... A lot of the similar craft things. So I'll just go through these one at a time first. Right. Now, are these done in Unity or Unreal? Uh, Unity. Unity. Okay. And did you just sign up for the class? Because I'm not seeing work in the class in here, or have you been in the class for a while? the uh, Booms and Blasts class. I have not done that yet. I've yeah. done the, the Photoshop one. OK, OK. So you haven't done the particle animation portion. Yeah. Got it. So you're getting going. You're, what year in college are you? Uh, second year. Second year, OK. That's cool that you've landed on knowing that you want to do effects. Yeah. Well, how did that how did that come about? What was it that got you super excited about a fight? Um, specific. So, first year was like we're doing uh, our thing called minor production, and it's a one month period where we um, start building our teams and stuff like that. And we were with programmers, designers, and a few artists. And I wanted to mostly try to dive into FX that time. And we were trying to make 
a fire solving puzzle game and that was perfect for me personally because i was able to dive into fire as you as you saw from the two fireballs nice all right so the first thing i want to point out hang on a sec is in all of your work, I think you're going to love the uh, particle animation portion of the class simply because you're going to find that there's some f foundational stuff with the shader that's really going to immediately benefit you in how the shader operates. A lot of your particle textures are one static texture on here. And I think each of them is going to be uh, substantially improved by adding a multiply uh, on top of it, like a multi-texture, so that it has like two textures panning at separate rates. Mm -hmm. And it'll help it feel more like energy sitting in that world that's going to make it more convincing and more believable. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's fine, I think, to have very crisp edged shapes in your work. I think that's very positive and and cool if, if that's the kind of world that you have is a very cartoony sort of world. But definitely if you're going for a game like the League of Legends or Overwatch, you're going to want to soften up some of those edges and you're going to want to okay. make them feel more like it's painted smoke, you know, or painted energy that sits in that world. Because here, this texture that's spiraling inward, is just one big flat shape. And yeah. even if even if that had like spiraling strips of energy like painted into it that was all like varied transparency and you know crisp edges and soft edges kind of blended together to feel like a, a vortex kind of texture, that's gonna feel a lot stronger. And you'll even find in the class, like literally you can go in and, and take a texture from the class and just swap it out with this maybe with some slight modifications and already it's going to be improved but then okay. also if you go in and you uh, multiply another texture in with it in the material that we have you're going to get even more interesting motion and more uh, believable energy sense of energy gathering in now are you familiar with what i'm uh, expressing with two textures molting together or multiplied together um kind of uh i'm thinking of it like when they multiply together it becomes darker in a sense yeah so think of it like um two gradients that are subtle and then they uh, overlay like if you go into i guess i could do a quick quick little demo of this i'll pop up in photoshop here in a second um but if you think of it in terms of this going while I'm talking. So if you think of it in terms of like a value between 0 and 1 and then another value between 0 and 1 and then multiplying those two values together and you're going to get you're right that would get darker so if I do it's funny I just got Windows 10 set up so it reset everything for me. There we go. It's like got the tips. It's like you can learn. We'll teach you. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, Photoshop. You're so nice. Oh jeez. Okay. So here we go. If I invert, there we go. Invert there, and then let's say I've got like a white layer here. That is my Cintiq even set up? I don't even think it is. No, it's not. Rest in peace. It's all good. So if I've got like, you know, some kind of wispy texture here mm -hmm. and, you know, then it's like tiled as well. So that's not really a tile, but you get the idea, right? So then mm -hmm. it's on that ring that you've got 
because I'm guessing that's a ring mesh. Is that correct? That's like a uh, yeah, a ring mesh with like a texture on it, similar to kind of like this. So you've kind of got all these shapes, and then if I come in here, there it is, the smudge tool, and then I like make it kind of wispy. So it feels like ethereal smoky wisps and we and we cover this kind of content in the in the class about like you know creating textures that feel like they're hand painted because they are hand painted mm -hmm. but really it's all about this variation um, in alpha so like you know it kind of fades in and out there okay so then i come into another layer and let's say this other layer is just like basically a noise field. Okay. Get my fuzzy eraser as well. Right. And then normally if you just, oops, if you overlay them on top of each other, they sort of do this business. Right. But if you change this to overlay. No. I'm actually not sure what the equivalent would be. It should be like taking away from the other one. Unless, did I not erase anything in the middle? No, it should definitely. Oh boy. Maybe it's like subtract. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So if you do like a subtract, right? And then as it moves, it's going to create like an ethereal sort of vibe. Oh, See, I'm I've seen these with shaders. Yeah, I'm just moving in like a straight line through here. So it's going to do something like this. Okay. And it's going to create nice, interesting motion inside of your uh, material. And so the shader that we use in the class does this, it has this capability built into it and so you'll just have easy access to that which okay. is going to take your work all of your work to sort of the next level okay so that was like kind of way too time consuming <laughs> but we yeah um, so when you look at some of these others as well like this um this texture that you have on this sphere mm -hmm. i think it's just too high frequency and too um detailed for how small it is on the screen and for how fast the sphere is rotating. And so okay. you end up just having a very high detail bunch of lines that are just whizzing around. And I don't really get a sense for them being like runic or astrological or whatever it is that the thematic is supposed to be. I'm missing it completely. So typically if you want runes, you generally want them to stay stationary or very slowly moving. You don't want them to travel very quickly and slide. Something that we can do, like on Rise in, in League of Legends, is we leave the runes in the trail, and they sort of like fade in in place really, uh, really violently, really quickly, and then they fade out in place, right? Yeah. And so you can have runes and sigils and stuff like that have a very dramatic animation to them, but when they actually translate really quickly or they rotate really quickly they typically fall apart just because the nature of a rune is that it is like on off and it's a very crisp edge and it's a very thin mark so i'd recommend against doing that there i think it's a a misaligned combination of elements instead if you wanted an energy sphere that's kind of spinning around right here I would go back to doing something more elemental, something more made of wispiness or like, you know, glowing something or other. Like, okay. Let's, uh, just take 
this. I'm going to come over into Photoshop. So when I'm talking something kind of wispy, what I mean to say, just to show you. So if that's your sphere, maybe instead go with, oh man, I don't have my Cintiq, this is killing me. I came unprepared today. <laughs> so you can either have something that's like, kind of like radial um, camera facing cards. So let's see how well I do without my trusty tools. It's funny because I usually don't dive into Photoshop in these videos. Mm -hmm. I won't need Photoshop. I can wait to install the Cintiq stuff. No. And they can like do like, uh, it's terrible. You kind of like smudge them or blur them coming in. And so like as they're, Going out, the outer edge is a little bit crisper than the inner edge. If that's making sense. This looks so terrible. So you end up with like a really bad drawing, but <laughs> <laughs> the idea being that there's these wisps that are more radial in nature and they're traveling outward right like they're growing outward or sucking inward i guess if you wanted to show it like it's gathering energy mm -hmm. work fine too yeah you could do something like that or of course if you wanted to keep it mapped to the sphere itself you know, you want to use that sphere's UVs. You could do energy like this. And then have it sort of, you know, similar similar styling of texture, right? Where it's kind of got this, this vibe going on. And you can like fill it in with bigger blotches of like wispiness as well. Okay. Yeah, I've so, seen this kind of style in like Valorant. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Valorant's awesome. A good friend. Well, a few of my good friends worked on that, actually, of course. <laughs> They're really doing really cool stuff over there. Know who did which effects though i need to go find out those guys who's responsible for this it's gorgeous <laughs> they have a few vfx artists over there i'm sure they all contributed in very awesome ways so yeah you could paint something like that under the uvs um you know and get some some slidey motions like in Valorant. Either it could like spin around or it could like slide upward on the UVs, gathering into a pinch at the top or or down from the top. Something of that nature is what I would do for the center sphere. I would just avoid whatever you do, I would just avoid the rune approach. Okay. In that instance. Okay. All right. So let's see what's next. Any any questions so far, or thoughts or comments? Um, I think like one thing that I have trouble with is uh trying to practice it in a sense where like I wanna just take like a half hour on this and be like I just want to just get into Unity and just try to practice it. Uh, what are your tips? on how to approach uh, practicing. Hmm. I think it needs to be a mixture. I think quick exercises are valuable. Mm -hmm. You're talking about just like 
messing around and then moving on, right? Yeah. Quick exercise is useful because it keeps your spirits high. You're like, well, you know, it was just a quick and dirty attempt. And if it doesn't look that great, that's because I didn't spend a lot of time on it and nothing lost, right? I think that's right. valuable both in sketching, like actually drawing in a sketchbook and in sketching of particle effects because it keeps that motivation going, that momentum. But if that's all you do, then you're never going to really stretch yourself because what you find in those quick little sketches is you just kind of quickly mash together what you already know. And you're not going to do a lot of things you don't know how to do because those are the things that are really slow for you. Okay. And you tend to avoid that because you're like, I don't, I don't want to spend that much time on it. I'll just kind of, you know, mash it together. So it is important to do the deep study where, you know, you take time in a figure drawing class or in an anatomy book, like drawing the structure of all the bones, right? Like every single thing and you figure out how the light wraps around the form and really studying everything very detailed and taking a long time on just one piece of art. And that applies directly as well to effects where every now and then you do need to really go deep on an effect. And I know that, uh, you know, sometimes that might not be your style if you do tend to be the type of person that wants to do it fast, but understanding that about yourself and then just saying, Hey, you know, this is going to make me go faster after I've mastered it. Right. It takes long the first time because you don't know how to do it. But after Mm -hmm. that you go way faster every time you do it afterwards. So certainly pays back in a big way. So, but then if that's all you ever do is you only ever do things that you're not good at and that you go slow at, then you might burn out. (laughs) You might get discouraged and frustrated and not want to do it anymore. So that's why I say mix it up. If you feel yourself getting bogged down, just be like, man, I just want to make a nice, satisfying little thing. Like I did that one other time, but maybe I'll just change something in a very direct way. And I have a clear idea in my mind how to do that. I think that's the key is like, you know, you're in your comfort zone. If it's, if you're getting clear ideas of how to do it and definitely you should, right? Like that's how you mm-hmm. fill up a portfolio is like, Oh, I had this idea for this thing. And I wish I just could see it in my mind and I had to make it a reality. Those are going to be some of your strongest works, but you can only take those to a, a really high end level. If you've, expanded your library your mental library and your mental tool set to the point where you can do some impressive stuff that starts popping into your own mind because you've studied how other people do it yeah that was a very long answer for a very short question yeah so tell me about this what's the technique you're using on the trails there um, it's, it had to do with a lot of noise. Um, it was an additive texture. It was, uh, is it on a yeah. mesh or a ribbon? Oh, it's on a ribbon. Is it lots of little ribbons? Yeah, it's a lot of li- riddle, little ones. Okay. Okay. So you've got a noise texture, essentially. It's like sliding along these ribbons, and then you've got new ribbons spawning all the time. Mm-hmm. And then you've got these little particles. Are these also on ribbons, or are those in a, like a noise field or like an orbit or something like that? Um, they're actually making the trail. <laughs> oh, those are the leads. Yeah. I see, I see. And so then they are using some kind of orbit or like random noise in their velocity yeah interesting so this must just operate in local space right because these ribbons the missiles traveling to the left right yeah so these these ribbons are not it's kind of like bending my brain a little bit they are if this missile travels these don't get left behind do they they like stay attached yeah yeah that's interesting it's funny because like i would never i would never think to do it this way (laughs) 
<laughs> That's so funny because it's so opposite of normally ribbons. The lead is up here at the front and then it yeah. spawns off the back. It's kind of cool that you did that though. Okay. At any rate, um, I think it looks pretty cool. I think you've got a nice focal point at the head and then it fades off to these like deeper reds back here, which is pretty neat. I do wonder about this big orange block. What is that supposed to be? Is that for gameplay? Is there something there? Uh, it's like a meteor rock thing. Okay. So right now it's just kind of sitting on top of the effect and I don't mm -hmm. know its connection to anything. So it doesn't look like it's on fire. It doesn't look like it's made of the same thing as all this other stuff happening around it that's animated. It's just very static and stationary. Ah. I think if you're going to do a 3D object in there, you need to paint a glow on the front, and you need to match the tail of it color-wise to what's coming out behind it. And then you need to switch up the render order so that some of these things are actually rendering in front of it. Because right now, everything uh, is rendering behind it, and it feels weird. So you need to figure out a way so that elements are coming in front, both on the leading edge and then on the trailing edge, or the trailing um, trails. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I, I kind of like the uh, head. I think you could have more interesting motion in the head. Again, I think you're going to find a lot of fun with the, the texture molt technique kind of traveling through there. I also think, you know, beware of the head. It's kind of like a full circle. And I guess, yeah. I guess that could be fine that it curves back down toward the trail, right? But it just kind of ends, and there's no sense that, like, maybe there should be, like, some little flex and bits, like, coming off of this hot edge. You know, something like that. Because okay. right now it's just like it, it kind of ends and it doesn't really, this is a very empty, unloved space up here. Mm. You could maybe even have these ribbons start at a wider cone and then they suck into more of a centralized space. I don't know if they're set up to easily do that. They might not be and that's fine. Then you can do some other element in here instead if you can't use the trails. I think also the key with fire is right now this is all additive and you don't have much a sense of the like charred dark brown slash saturated red that's near black. You don't have uh -huh. a sense of that like burnt smoky charred feeling coming off of it. And so it's just an additive thing flying through the air, and there's no, it's not convincing that it's burning. It's almost like yellow and red magic and not fire. Okay. Yeah. Um, so adding some smokiness into the trail, like it's, you know, actually burning a fuel source and emitting some kind of emission, some kind of smoke, it's going to really help that out quite a bit. And you have these lines out around it. They're really subtle, and I respect that. Oops. I respect the subtlety of these uh, surrounding lines. It is kind of weird that they start out in front. That's just a polished thing. Definitely, they okay. should be starting back here behind the edge of the, the lead. Like they're connecting to this, and I think that'll help those. And you could go darker with them. I think you can make them feel more burnt. That could be like the first element that you do that feels like smoky burntness. Like an oil fire. Yeah, is this another attempt at the same effect? Yeah, this is the same attempt. Yeah, there's some things about it that I like more. Like it does answer that of the, the bits coming from further out of the edge of that lead. <laughs> I think the trouble I'm having now is that, you know, the silhouette you end up getting with all those trails is like yeah. three lumps, you know? Yeah. Um, 
if you could make it feel more like a corkscrew and that probably means like spawning significantly fewer trails or something or like varying up or randomizing how they orbit over time it can become interesting right now they're all just orbiting very very same uh -huh. which i mean you've got so many of them it's like a tragedy that they're all just doing the same thing the strength of having that many should be that you have nice variety and a nice organic feel because they're all kind of doing something a little different from each other. But I will say that might end up like what you've got here might not be super optimized. I kind of get the feeling like, Oh geez, that's a ton of little ribbons, you know? Um, yeah, that makes sense. It might not be that bad. I mean, the, the funny thing is I say it's not super optimized, but then I can see that you have a low tessellation. So it's like got these like square edges poking up and out, which might be a cool, interesting stylistic choice, but then you've got it rounded and soft up here. And so I know you're not going for a graphic style and I know that that's just really low tessellation on your ribbons. So that's not a good thing. These skinnier ones coming in front have a much better smooth smoothness to them like i can yeah. see the little test bits of tessellation but it's really not that bad because it slides by so quickly i've also noticed the hard edges i just didn't know how to com combat it and it was just like yeah. yeah i think it's uh well in unreal it's like a spawn rate thing okay or it's either well it's one of a few things it's either the spawn rate or it's the there's like tessellation settings in the the ribbon properties we have some working ribbons in the class that you can dissect and look at and see how we did it there mm -hmm. so that should be helpful for you and then you had some others down here that i skipped yeah so this impact is this it here again higher resolution yeah okay so i like the wind up it's like i think yeah. that you could just make it snappier at the point of impact so right now it like uh the center the core it fades out let's see if i can get right to it so the center does its thing like whoo, you know mm -hmm. and it would be really cool if this ring very briefly, like at this frame, and this is important to be frame perfect on an impact because you want it to snap just to the right way. So like right as soon as this is gone and these start coming out, right now what you've got is that this ring just keeps compressing in. Either you're going to want to snap it out just like a couple beats after. So it's like the center goes and then the ring sucks away too. Or the center goes and then the ring grows a little bit and then sucks out. Okay. But right now it's just kind of um, anticlimactic in a way. Because that center ring just like sort of disappears on us. Yeah. Now the bits that fly outward. I think you could really slow them way down. So they come out really nice, really fast, really snappy. But then over their lifetime, they don't really slow down much at all. They just kind of keep sliding outward. But in reality, let alone a stylized game, they're going to hit resistance as they hit air friction, and they're going to slow down. And so Okay, so kind of like a drag. Yeah, put some drag on there for sure. And okay. as you put more drag, you're going to need to probably bump up the initial velocity to accommodate so that they hit the same sp spots coming out. And then beyond that, I would just change the lifetime to be randomized because right now they all live exactly the same life. Yeah. And they need to be unique little snowflakes, each with its own lifetime. All right, that covers all the work. Is there anything that you wanted me to revisit or maybe talk about your 3D work as well? Or what do you want um, to go over from here in the last couple minutes? I think that's all. I think 
you've answered like most of my questions. I feel like I just need to dive into those courses even more. Um, especially with the the shader that you created in Unreal. Uh, I haven't touched Unreal yet, but I don't wanna I don't wanna try it. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're going to love it. I think honestly, it's you're at a point now where you have a foundational knowledge of creating particle systems. And I think you're going to just take off once you dive into those portions and working with those assets that are definitely more advanced. You're going to start dissecting them. And with the mind that you have and the abilities that you already have got, you're really going to take to it like a fish in water. So I'm excited to see what you do. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty excited myself. Yeah, Enjoy that quarantine life. Yeah. <laughs> Doing online lessons. That's the way to go. Yep. All right. Well, take care. Yep. You too. We'll see you. Thank bye. you. Yep. Bye-bye.